Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the CORE Institute as we discuss common knee injuries in the aging athlete. Before we get started, I would like to share with you a quick tip on how to engage with us throughout the presentation. We know you may have questions during the presentation, so please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. We will have a Q&A session afterward to answer all of them. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. William Kesto of the CORE Institute. Dr. Kesto is fellowship trained and board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder, elbow, and knee. All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is our first ever webinar in Michigan, and we're happy to have all of you here with us to discuss some of the common knee injuries. All right, so just a quick overview. We'll go over some of the anatomy of the knee, talk about a meniscus injury, ligament injury, some of the common tendon injuries, uh, touch on osteoarthritis of the knee, and some of the new regenerative medicine uh, techniques that we are doing here at the CORE Institute as well. So the knee joint is one of the most frequently injured joints in the body. It's the largest joint in the body and a synovial hinge joint. It mainly flexes and extends, but does have a slight rotational component as well uh, with twisting. Uh, there's certainly increase in sports injuries and awareness. There's obviously a big push for everyone to get healthy, uh, and that involves getting all of our joints moving. And a big part of that is the impact that goes through our knees. Uh, we have uh, higher activity patients in both young and older patients, uh, which are placing increased demand on the body. Demographics, again, are changing because of the impact of obesity, age, and activity levels. And chronic joint conditions may start in one area of the body, but it may extend into another area, uh, especially uh, as you see in this photo here, where it's one big kinetic chain from the uh, ankle to the knee to the hip. So you can see a uh, you know, number of people visiting the physician per year. Uh, spine being number one and the knee coming in at 12.5 at million uh, patients. And over the next 20 years, we certainly expect hip replacements and knee replacements to increase significantly. So knee anatomy consists of three bones, uh, which are the main parts of the joint. That's the femur, uh, the tibia, and the patella. Uh, these are stabilized by four main ligaments, and which we'll talk about uh, later. And the patella tracks in the trochlear glue, groove uh, and is connected at the top of the knee uh, with the quadriceps tendon and at the bottom with the patella tendon. So patella femoral joint is a common cause of uh, complaints of knee pain, especially in the front side of the knee uh, between the patella and the femur. And the patella's main job is to increase the mechanical advantage of the quad muscle uh, and protect the knee joint uh, from the front. This is, gains the most stress on it, especially with bending, kneeling down, going up and down stairs. These are going to be the common causes of complaints uh, related to the patellofemoral joint. Uh, a Q angle is an important factor here in determining uh, who complains of patellofemoral pain. As you can see on the left side of the screen, uh, a normal Q angle is more vertical. A larger Q angle places more of an outside stress lateral force on the patella and this can cause uh, people to have clicking in the knee or popping in the knee or wear out a certain part of the patella cartilage quicker uh, and women are have a bigger Q angle and more patella femoral pain uh, because of a wider pelvis so the cruciate ligaments are the two ligaments in the middle of the knee uh, they help control rotational stability, as well as uh, anterior to posterior or front to back translation of the knee. And they connect the femur to the tibia. The ACL is the more important of the two ligaments. Uh, it attaches anterior side of the tibia, just medial to the medial meniscus, uh, and attaches on the posterior side of the femur. Uh, it's more important for cutting, pivoting, twisting, and rotating. So this is the ligament that is frequently torn uh, with young athletes uh, who uh, either through contact or non-contact uh, injury with a sudden movement. The PCL is in the back of the knee and this can be stretched out over time. There can also be traumatic injuries of this. 
it helps prevent posterior translation, so your tibia going backwards on the femur. Uh, but many times this uh, can go without surgery, even if injured. The MCL is the ligament on the inside portion of the knee. Uh, it's important in side to side stability. So if you were, you know, moving sideways and felt your knee buckle, it could be a cause, uh, you know, a tear of the MCL uh, could be a reason for that. It's also very closely attached to the medial meniscus. So injury to one can result in injury to both. The LCL is on the opposite side of the knee and also controls side to side stability. It's less injured uh, because it's shorter and stronger than the MCL. Now, one of the more important structures of the knee is the meniscus. The meniscus is two half moon wedge shaped fibrocartilage located on the tibia and they help provide shock absorption in the knee. The medial is more often torn as it uh, is less mobile than the lateral meniscus. The bursa sac, uh, there's several of these in the knee. More commonly, you may see uh, an image as the one shown in the bottom picture, where if someone was doing some gardening, or oftentimes we see this in, in carpet layers where they uh, rub or irritate the front of the knee, and that bursa can become swollen. And patients may come in and ask for the fluid to be drained, where sometimes these become infected and we have to take uh, people to surgery to help clear out the infection. Uh, more often, they do resolve over time with just some compression wrap uh, to help decrease the swelling. There's also, you may have heard of uh, a popliteal cyst or a swelling in the back of the knee as seen here. Uh, and the popliteal space is the area behind the knee that contains these important blood vessels and nerves. Uh, and depending on the location of these cysts, they can be aspirated or drained in our office using ultrasound. But if they're too close to the, to the vessels, then we tend to leave them alone. Uh, more often, these are happening because of some kind of pathology or injury to inside the knee. And this causes a swelling to be pushed towards the back of the knee. And it's a one-way valve, so it only can go out and it gets stuck in the back of the knee uh, and can't come uh, forward into the knee to be absorbed. Every once in a while, these will get so big that they pop and then the person's leg will swell up significantly and you think you're having a, a blood clot, you go to the emergency room and you know an ultrasound just shows this popliteal cyst. Uh, but the main way to treat these is to find the source of all that swelling. So on the inside of the knee or the medial side of the knee, we do have our hamstring tendons that come down and attach. Uh, and under these tendons, which are called the pes answer and muscle group, uh, there can also be a bursa that gets inflamed uh, and is usually treated with physical therapy or some topical cream and other anti-inflammatory medications. Every once in a while, we can place a cortisone injection in the site. So how do these uh, ligaments get uh, injured? Usually it's a direct contact to the side of the knee uh, that'll cause an injury to the MCL. Typically treated with rest as the, most of these do heal on their own unless they're associated with other uh, ligamentous or meniscal injury to the knee. Uh, you can be immobilized like this, keeping your legs straight uh, for several weeks and that usually scars it down and then starting a focused uh, physical therapy program. Typically, a uh, light sprain will heal in about four weeks or so, and a higher grade sprain with bigger injury or tearing may take several months to heal, or even possibly needing surgery, as is the case in this one, as you see on this MRI along the tibia where the green arrow, sh arrow shows the ligament pulled away from the bone. So in this case, it's less likely for this to heal, and we have to uh, reattach the ligament uh, and add some really strong suture to help support it while it heals. And the recovery from this type of injury is several months to return to play. The LCL can be hurt. This is on the outside of the leg. You can see this is a stress view image where we're pushing on the side of the leg to see how much injury there is to the LCL. Uh, and you can see that's pretty significant. I mean, it doesn't take a anybody with extra training to realize that's a bad thing right there. So 
this person uh, is indicative of, of surgery. Again, talking about the ACLs, it is the main ligament of the knee. Uh, and, you know, typically someone will hear a, a, a pop, uh, there'll be buckling of the knee, and it really a large swelling, uh, which is the most common. Uh, treatment initially is ice, rest, uh, you know, seeing an orthopedic specialist and likely MRI for confirmation of the diagnosis as well as looking for any other associated injuries uh, to any other ligaments or uh, of the meniscus. Now, sometimes these are chronic and they may not just be in one sports injury, but may tear over time. And the hallmark symptom of the ACL injury is a, a shifting or a buckling of the two bones on each other uh, with sudden twisting or, or change of direction movement. Uh, females are uh, more commonly injured than males, and we think this is due to several factors, including uh, biomechanical factors uh, in muscle imbalances between the quadriceps and the hamstrings. Um, there's a theory about uh, hormonal influences, and again, as we mentioned earlier with the Q angle, some anatomic bony risk factors. So once this is torn, the rotational stability of the knee is compromised. Uh, you get, often complain of a giving way feeling, and it's very difficult to play any type of uh, impact or aggressive sports without an ACL. Now, if somebody said, well, doc, all I like to do is swim or just run straight. I don't have to do any type of cutting or you know, twisting movement or sudden movement, then you really don't need your ACL fixed. Although, uh, not having the ACL and having sudden shifting movements or giving way, coming down the stairs or walking on uneven ground can lead to other injuries. And so therefore we take each case very specifically to decide who can go with and without surgery. Because sometimes we can brace these injuries uh, and people can get by. So uh, traditional the thinking is that the ACL does not have a good blood supply and therefore it cannot heal itself and has to be reconstructed, meaning that we take part of your tissue, whether it's a part of your hamstring, your patellar tendon, or even donated cadaver tissue to recreate a, a ligament. And we place it uh, in its anatomic position through the tibia and the femur by drilling these sockets or tunnels and then holding it there with these buttons or screws uh, as it heals into those positions. Recently, we've been able to create new techniques where if the ligament is just slightly torn from the top of the femur, uh, we can repair it in the hopes of getting it to heal back to where it belongs. And this can certainly speed up the recovery, which becomes three or four months instead of nine months. It's a lot less painful. Uh, but it has to be done relatively quickly. So within the first uh, one to three weeks after injury. And that's because the ligament will start to scar down and the body will eat some of it up the longer it stays torn, making it more difficult to repair, therefore requiring a reconstruction. So meniscus tear, this is probably the most common complaint that we do see in our office. Uh, again, the meniscus is the cushion in between the two joints. It is made of a, a cartilage, uh, which helps absorb the stress and the shock from the contact of the femur on the tibia. The medial meniscus is attached to posterior medial side. Again, it's more injured because uh, it is tethered more tightly and therefore less pliable. So twisting is the most common injury. And this is not only sports, but even a, a factory job. Uh, where there's a repetitive uh, continued movement and over time the meniscus which has a lot of water and shock absorption when we're young uh, as we get older the meniscus starts to dry out and becomes more brittle and so more easily uh, torn and small tears are maybe not even noticed but if the tear gets bigger and enlarges and starts to have a flap of tissue that starts catching in the knee or locking. This is what brings uh, people to the office and what typically needs further treatment. 
So you can see here an uh, example on this view of this bucket handle tear. This is a, a higher grade or worse type of injury. And, and you can imagine this tissue flipping back and forth like a bucket handle and getting caught in the knee, causing severe pain. And these are those that either have to be trimmed away or repaired. Now, we always try to repair them, at least I do, uh, as I was trained as a sports medicine physician. Uh, my job is to save the knee and save the meniscus and as much of this cartilage, because once we lose it, it's gone. Uh, and then that leads to progression of arthritis because there's no cushion between the bones. Uh, you can see on the MRI, that signal there on, on the right side of the screen, that line indicating that tear where the orange and green arrows are. So this is what it can look like during the scope, during the arthroscopy with the camera. You can see a normal meniscus on the left, nice smooth border. You can see great cartilage on the, on the femur on the top and the tibia on the bottom. The other picture is evidence of a tear. And the picture on the right is a case that we did recently uh, in a 48 year old gentleman who had a pretty large tear, a bucket handle tear. You can see those kind of white and blue stripes those are uh, the sutures that we placed to fix the meniscus. Now, part of it was torn. You can see we did have to trim in this kind of central area. There was not good tissue there, uh, but we were able to save most of this meniscus uh, to prevent any further breakdown of the cartilage above and below it. So one new technique that we're using to treat the meniscus is using PRP, which is the platelet-rich plasma. Uh, this is kind of going along the regenerative medicine or the stem cell therapies. Although there is no cells in the PRP, the PRP is drawn from the blood and spun down. And then we inject the platelets into the site of injury, especially with the lower grade or lower injury type tears. And these can then recruit growth, secret growth factors and recruit cells to the site to help promote healing. And that's, as you see here, these growth factors promote an inflammatory and fibroblastic and maturation phases of healing. Another common complaint is uh, of anterior knee pain is patella tendonitis. So the patella tendon connects the patella to the tibia and uh, can have stress on it, usually at the inferior pole of the patella. This is mostly treated through uh, physical therapy, rest, as well as a compression brace or, or a strap that goes around the tibia to help take pressure off the patella tendon. Now, if that doesn't work, that is when we can also inject the PRP to help promote healing at the site of the patella tendonitis or uh, any chronic uh, tendonitis. That doesn't get better through physical therapy. So pain specifically located right at the front of the knee. Again, you modify activity. Oftentimes this is because uh, of an overuse injury. Somebody, let's say, tried to get into working out but was doing too much too quickly or was doing, doing uh, squats, let's say, incorrectly. Uh, you know, so looking at the patient, making sure they're doing the workout correctly, listening to our body uh, is very important uh, to in prevention of these injuries. And then obtaining the right treatment through physical therapy to know the correct stretches and, and strengthening exercises to uh, get back. So the quad tendon is made up of these three uh, muscles which uh, join to form the tendon here. These are your, your thigh, large thigh muscles. Um, you can see they go all the way from the, you know, the top of the femur spanning down to the to the knee. The hamstring muscles are in the back, and that's the semitendinosus, the biceps, and the semimembranosus. Uh, as well as, you know, not pictured here, is the uh, gracilis. So tendonitis is inflammation of the tendon. Uh, the tendons connect muscles to bones. So when the tendons are inflamed, anytime you're activating the muscle that's pulling on that tendon, uh, that movement becomes painful. Uh, and again, as mentioned before, this is usually from an overuse injury. Uh, infection is very rare. That, that would be something more common in uh, the fingers for, in relation to the tendons. But uh, yeah, when it comes to the knee, it's usually more an overuse injury or uh, 
you know, improper mechanics related to activity. So uh, this is mostly diagnosed through physical exam. MRI and ultrasound can help us to quantify, you know, in cases that just don't want to get better, that's when we'll go to the MRI to assess the level of injury. And you can see the difference in the two uh, here between a healthy patel tendon on the left and a uh, inflamed and uh, highly painful tendon on the right. So proper conditioning and a gradual return to activity, proper warm up and stretching program, uh, if you're, you know, a runner, making sure you have the right shoes uh, for that or any orthotics that may be needed. Uh, it's rest, physical therapy, uh, and cortisone injections are limited when it comes to uh, tendons uh, because the cortisone can be, or the steroid can be damaging to the tendon structure. Uh, surgery is, is rare in these instances. And again, using PRP as a new modality uh, is gaining favor and more studies are coming for this. So like I said before, what is PRP? Well, we're taking all your blood and then we spin it down. And this is the yellowish layer, the plasma that has those platelets in there. Uh, and those platelets are then concentrated by uh, millions and injected to the site of the tendonitis via uh, ultrasound guidance. Again, using the MRI uh, as uh, a method to kind of help guide us to the site of, of injury. And we do this in the shoulder often. Uh, and so this is why the PRP is so good. So our body has what we need to, to heal. We just have to get it to the right site. And, you know, the PRP through all these growth factors can, you know, help promote uh, cartilage restoration, uh, vascular healing potential, as well as the synovium, uh, which is the lining of every joint. One other thing I want to mention is these anti-proteases. So in a way, you know, when the knee uh, becomes arthritic, there's enzymes that are increasing that are furthering the breakdown. And the PRP can help promote uh, anti-proteases to help stop those other breakdown enzymes and therefore slow the arthritis progression. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, uh, PRP is not covered by insurance, and so it is an out-of-pocket expense. Uh, and so that's, you know, one of the cons is the price. But uh, the advantages are it can expedite a healing process. It's using your own body. It's a 15-minute in-office procedure where there's no time away from work or any risks of surgery. Uh, and so those are its uh, advantages. It does take, you know, a while to, to work. It does take two to three months to know if it's uh, doing what it's supposed to in there. Uh, just as if you had had a procedure, it would take some time for that healing to happen. And so uh, for someone looking for an immediate relief, it may not be the answer, uh, but it's certainly another modality that we can use. So uh, just, you know, who's a candidate for that? It's someone who's failed a prior treatment, uh, who cannot take Motrin for some reason, uh, whose systems are persistent enough to consider surgery but not yet ready for it, uh, who's not a candidate, someone who uh, cannot have their blood removed or someone who's on blood thinners uh, or unable to be off of them before or after the procedure. So these are just some studies showing the effects of these where, you know, it increased cell proliferation and these Glycosaminoglycans and collagen synthesis, these are the structures that make up our, our cartilage. And the hyaluronic acid, which is the fluid normally in the knee, which helps lubricate the knee, all these uh, were increased with PRP injection. So arthritis is a degenerative bone disease uh, that causes cartilage found on healthy joints to break down, removing the buffer between the bones. So we mentioned one type of cartilage, which was the meniscus and the cushion between the bones. And then the, the other type of cartilage is that which on top of or coats the femur and the tibia. And that's a type two cartilage. And, and that's so well made uh, in our anatomy that it's more slippery uh, on top of each other than skates on ice. So I know I'm not a good skater. And every time I get there, I'm just thinking of how bad I'm going to fall down. 
And if you imagine that our cartilage was so well built that it's even more slippery than that. And that's why we want to preserve as much of that as we can. So some non-surgical treatments for arthritis include weight loss. Uh, and that's important because weight is a four to one ratio on our knees so, and hips and ankles. So just a 10 pound loss will decrease the pressure on our joints by 40 pounds. And so that plays a big role in uh, the timing of breakdown, you know, slowing that down as well as pain. So if you think about the less pressure you're putting there, uh, the less painful it will be. Uh, you can do uh, NSAIDs, uh, which is like your Motrin family injections, uh, some of which we've talked about. Uh, changing activity. So if someone was a runner, they may have to stop being a runner and, and switch to biking or non-impact activities. Uh, and then surgeries for those that in which other treatments are unresponsive. So again, as mentioned before, arthritis is basically the wear and tear uh, pattern. You know, like I, I mentioned to my patients, eventually your car tire wears out and you have to replace it. It's very similar to our joints. Uh, what starts to happen then is because the cartilage is worn down, as you see in this, in this x-ray, uh, the body will start to make bone spurs. And the bone spurs are there to help distribute the force over an even area uh, where the cartilage is no longer there. And, you know, I often ask my patients, I'm trying to gauge how bad their pain is, you know, uh, is this something that only happens once in a while? Is it every day? Uh, can you walk around the block and not have to sit down or, or go home? Can you make it through the grocery store or the mall? Uh, these are, you know, important parts of daily life. And if it's difficult to get those through that, then it may be that that patient is closer to uh, a bigger intervention such as surgery. And the most common symptom of this is pain. Uh, pain that starts to uh, become more consistent uh, the joints eventually become stiff and swollen um, and they lose motion. And here's a picture of that, what happens. You can see the white shiny cartilage and some of that we saw in the er earlier pictures. Uh, but as that breaks down, you see the pink there where the, where the uh, all is pointing uh, on the tibia there and that's all the way down to bone. So that area uh, is now getting, you know, think of a pothole. Uh, at first, a pothole may be small and your tires don't even feel it, but as that pothole gets bigger, the divot gets bigger, uh, you'll start to feel more pain. And it gets, the surrounding structure then gets weaker and it's just a, a bad cycle. You can see here how there's just no space left there on the outside of this knee, uh, and that's the joint collapse that we mentioned. And you may notice that one day your legs were straight and then they became bow-legged, or they became knock kneed and that's part of the deformity that happens as the cartilage breaks down and the ligaments then become stretched out and people have this instability of their knees as well. So one other treatment modality uh, that we mentioned, and this is again in the regenerative medicine family, where these, we're taking some of the fat from the abdomen or the buttocks and injecting that back into the body. Uh, and these, the fat is very good because it already has the stem cells in it. It has the fat adipocytes in it. It has these mesenchymal cells in it. Uh, it has blood vessels and nutrients in it. Uh, and when compared to bone marrow, because bone marrow is another alternative treatment, there's 100 to 500 times more reparative cells than an equivalent amount of bone marrow. Now, the difference with PRP is that PRP did not have any of these cells in it, whereas uh, the fat uh, does. Again, this is an office procedure uh, that can be done. It's less than one hour, uh, avoids surgery, uh, and does give that regenerative potential in, in recruitment. And it's all done through a local anesthetic, very uh, minimal pain. We're staying in this kind of layer that's just under your skin, so we're not penetrating into the abdomen. And these are blunt instruments, so uh, that we use and it's basically like a little mini liposuction. You can see from this video, uh, 
you know, what it looks like. It's pretty thick fluid. And the advantage of it is that it stays where we put it. So it stays in the knee. And the studies have shown that this can help give pain relief for up to 12 to 18 months. Now, is it going to take a completely worn out joint and make it brand new? Uh, I don't think anybody can honestly say that. Uh, they'd be lying to you if they did say it was the end all cure. Uh, but hopefully as more and more research comes out, we understand it more. Uh, we do know though that it does help with pain relief and, and that may be good enough for a lot of people. Again, this is a, an out-of-pocket expense. It's not covered by insurance. So surgical treatment for arthri uh, arthritis, uh, typically you know, once everything has failed, is total knee arthroplasty. And these typically last 15 to 20 years. Uh, it's one of the most successful procedures we do. The hip replacement is actually number one. Uh, we can do full knee replacements. We can do partial knee replacements if the arthritis is only located in one area of the knee. Uh, the partials tend not to last as long, and that's typically because uh, arthritis develops in other parts of the knee, and there's a conversion from a partial to a full knee replacement. And you can see some of that here, some of the partials where it's only on the medial side or only patellofemoral or only lateral, uh, or even a bicompartmental that I've, I've done a couple times as well. Recently, new technologies coming out as well, uh, where we can uh, use robotic assistance. Now, the robot is not doing the surgery. The surgeon still has to do the surgery, but the robot is giving us real-time information and real-time data in order to uh, line up the joint as perfectly as we can. And, you know, our expectation and our thinking is that if we can get that joint lined up as close to normal as possible, that will make them last longer. And we're actually, by using the robot, taking about 20% less bone uh, resected. And that's important when it comes to, let's say, having to do the surgery a second time, at, you know, 15, 20 years from now. The less bone we can cut and the more you can preserve, the better it is. And you can see how we can get, uh, you know, through these... Uh, cool pictures and we have this in the operating room telling us the degrees of rotation and alignment and and how much we're taking away and uh, you know how is the knee looking as it tracks on itself and uh, then you know this is a uh, pretty cool technology and uh, it continues to improve it can be used for the hip replacements as well and hopefully in the next couple of years they have their their shoulder model coming out Again, just showing some intraoperative pictures where you can do some fine tuning down to the millimeter uh, to get just the right fit. This is less invasive as well because typically we have to put rods up and down the femur and the tibia, uh, which can be painful. But in this case, we don't have to do that. But we do put alignment sensors inside the bone, uh, which are much smaller uh, than the rods that we would put inside the bone. So partial versus total knee, partial, slightly smaller incision. Uh, you know, we're removing the one arthritic portion of the knee. We're preserving healthy bone and tissue. It gives you a more natural feeling knee because we're not sacrificing any of the, the ligaments that we typically do in a, in a total knee replacement. Uh, the advantages of the robotic assisted surgery are a, a brief surgical plan. Uh, less implant wear and loosening, uh, theoretically, because of better alignment. It's bone sparing and, and uh, there's reduced blood loss. And this can be done as an outpatient surgery as well. So who's a good candidate for a partial? Uh, you know, it, it really depends on the patient and on, on the x-ray imaging, uh, but it's really when the arthritis is located to one area of the knee. So it's either on the inside of the knee or it's just underneath the kneecap and the rest of the knee looks pretty good. A total knee is when there's a constant knee pain, when it's in all three compartments, and again, failure to respond to other uh, non-invasive treatment options. And these are some of the x-ray imaging uh, of that as well. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. Uh, 
Uh, we do thank you all for listening. Uh, this is our local phone number, 248-349-7015 for an appointment.